Good morning. It's about time to get started here. Brother Sammy, is, is this large enough for you to see now? Oh, it's okay. This is our last class on uh, death and me. And um, the, uh, our, our fourth lesson. There will then be uh, two weeks, because we care starting, there will be two weeks in, uh, uh, in which uh, Brother West and others will be conducting uh, the services and the Wednesday classes and so on. And then uh, after those two weeks, we pick back up, um, as you can see from the posters outside, we pick back up with uh, Sunday's lessons to finish out uh, uh, August, Sunday classes. And then also for um, the last two uh, Wednesdays uh, in August. So a two-week break. Class is still here, but uh, it'll be handled with the week care uh, folks and predominantly uh, Brother West who will be there. Um, also, uh, the virtual word-for-word -word and, and everything I'm saying to you um, you can get after class, if you will, over here. Um, this particular lesson focusing upon heaven, it's interesting. I mentioned to you uh, last week uh, as we were dealing with, with hell that the Bible says very little about hell. Um, but it says enough that we know we don't want to be there. So, from that standpoint, when you compare that to the passages on heaven, it is, um, shall we say, somewhat overwhelming with all the passages available to us about heaven and God and us, well, those of us who go to heaven, um, those in the world who go to heaven, um, because of the fact that there is hell. So, um, I want to get right into the lesson. I can't cover all the passages. Most of them will just be quick uh, notations of what the passage is. But again, if you get the outline, um, they're all there and, and they're virtually uh, word for word as well. So that should be able to help you out. For this follow-up, <laughs> well, actually, uh, this fella who's been on this hilltop for all of our lessons, um, uh, it's actually time to make a change for him because even though this is the conclusion to our series on death and me, it is actually the focus upon heaven and me, which is where we want to be. For Christians, the natural conclusion, the only way to heaven, though, is through death. Please remember, we've used the caveat for all of these lessons, that short of the Lord coming back, until he does, and those who will be taken up at that time, before he comes back and we die, we're in this other process. Um, and the process uh, uh, that we have of uh, paradise and torment, and uh, then the resurrection from there to heaven or to the uh, pit of fire. Um, but, again, everything still has a caveat. The Lord comes right now. Actually, you don't need to spend time doing any more on this lesson because that prospect uh, will be, in some cases, uh, mute. Any whichever, the book of Revelation gives us a taste of what eternity holds and what heaven will truly be like. We know that God has declared for us in the 21st chapter of Revelation when he talks about that he saw a new heaven. Uh, and he saw what else? <clears throat> he saw a new earth. Mm, it gets a little confusing as everything is ending. There's a new heaven and there's a new earth. What's the earth doing around for? Hang on. 
So for the first heaven and the first earth, ooh, who's that? Well, let's see. This is the first earth I know about, and he's talking about a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have now passed away, Revelation tells us. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, um, coming down out of heaven from God, proceeded as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, and it said, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Sounds a little strange in one aspect because we talk about us dwelling with him. And he is talking about dwelling with us. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither, scripture says, shall there be mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. No more mourning and sorrow. There's no more crying. There is no more pain. Uh, there is none of that anymore. And, and former things, former, prior to that moment, the former things in our life have passed away. And in verse 5 he says, And he was sealed on the throne and said, Behold, and this is a key pasture, Pasture. It's key pastor, pasture. Well, well, you know what I'm saying. It is the key passage of the next verse here, which you hold on the most to when you're talking about heaven. Because in that he says, Behold, I am making all things new. All things new. New. That's the crucial difference between what we are and where we are and what we're doing. New earth, new heaven, God dwelling with man, and all things are made new. Well, what do we know about heaven then? It's a place of relationships. It's a place of relationships. We will know and love everyone perfectly. And do you know the people you don't get along with? Do you know the people you avoid? Well, here, you're going to get along with everyone and love everyone perfectly. Luke 20 says, And Jesus answered, saying unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. And he says, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, those neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels. Equal unto the angels and are the children of God. Being the children of the resurrection. Of the resurrection. A place of eternal life. There is no death anymore. John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall be alive. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. A place of purity. Revelation 22, and he showed me a pure uh, river of water. Pure river of water of life. Clear as a crystal, Scripture says. 
and proceeding out of the throne of God. That's the water is coming from. Throne, God, water is coming out, proceeding out of the throne and out of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street, and on both sides of the river, were the tree of life, and bare twelve manner of fruit on the trees, and yielded their fruit every month, the scripture says. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. A place of purity. A place of purity. First John, we are God's children, Scripture says. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Meaning, in what we will be transformed into has not yet appeared. And we, though we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, which means we then are transformed, when he appears, we shall be, Scripture says, like him. Like him. Because we shall see him as he is. But we don't see God as he is now, do we? We know of God. He communicates. We know what we are. To, he, we know what he expects of us. He knows what we know. What we, he is offering to us, but we have not seen him. In First Corinthians, however, it is written, "No eye has seen, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived." What God has prepared for those who love him. Meaning, let everybody imagine whatever they want. Let everybody theorize what everything is going to be. Let everybody try to have a concept of me and God and heaven and afterlife and so on and so forth. But he says, there is no eye that's ever been upon this earth anyway, and there is no ear that has ever been here on earth anyway, and there is no mind at all that conceived what God has prepared. None. None. We're told in generalities. We're cho told in a way in which we, being here, can gleam a concept but do we really know? No, we do not. We do not. It will be a place, though, that we realize is a place of worship. Revelation 20, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty, I saw no temple there, heaven. I saw no temple, because God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple already messes with what you think of things. Psalms 149 says, Praise the Lord. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Remember, everything is new up there? Now, I know when we have the songs up here that the majority of the folks here don't even need to look at the words because we know so many of them. You won't know these. New songs. You won't know those. You will sing a new song. His praise in the assembly of the saints. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. Let the saints rejoice in this honor. And sing for the joy on their hearts. Not only does scripture tell us to sing... But they tell us that God is worthy of song and that by singing to him, it is an honor to him. We do that now. We sing to him to honor him, to praise him. We honor and therefore we sing. And the singing to him, the scripture says, 
pleases God. Pleases God. And so wonderful for some of us, or maybe many of us, it's not whether we can carry a tune or not. It's not whether we're on pitch or not. It's the fact that we are singing to please God. Not to each other. It's an encouragement, but that isn't why we do it. It's to praise. It's for God to hear. In heaven, when we are in the presence of God, don't you think, when you're standing in the presence of God, that we will do whatever we can to honor God? Well, we're in the presence of God now. We're in the presence of God 24-7. We're never away from the presence of God. All the world is in the presence of God. So few realize or understand it. We're in the presence of God. In Revelation 22, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him, the scripture says. We will serve him. Oh, it won't be grudgingly, not whatsoever. It won't be because, oh, I forgot it. Got to go down to the temple, you know where he is, and serve him today. I'll be back by lunch. His servants will serve him. His servants will serve him. Those who have accepted Jesus are the servants that are spoken of here. His servants will serve him, and the servants are those who have accepted Jesus Christ. It's just that those who have accepted Jesus the Christ to be called or to be known as a servant to be called or be known as a servant is one of the most honorary titles that there is within scripture there is nothing of greater honor for us than to be called that and desire to be that and, and, and the fundamental reason probably is because as, as mankind, we were, we were made, we were made before birth to serve God. We were made before birth to serve God. And given the option of not serving God. He didn't, he didn't stick it in us to serve him. But we know from where we come. But not all serve. Not all deal with that. We were made to serve in them, not just for a short time while on earth. God made us for eternity. Right, we, we, we realize that the, 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 the ghibli goop here is just a house, just holding, it's a container, it's what the body's for and so on. It'll be done away with. But the soul that he put in this body, that soul he has put in this body, there's no destruction of that soul. It lasts for eternity. Now, its eternity may be in hell. But prayerfully, his eternity of the soul in your body will be eternity in heaven. But it's eternity any way you look at it. Any way you look at it. Well, where else do you want to be? The body was made to serve God here and now, but the spirit, the soul he put in us, was made to live for eternity. And it will go. God never permit for us to be retired from serving him. We, we, we have this happen to us. We have, I don't know, do, do we, maybe we could just not go. Let's don't go on Wednesday. 
you know, I got that thing at work I got to take care of by tomorrow, and, and, and honey, you're not looking like you're up to cooking tonight. And so, eh, it's just, don't go to be with the other saints. Don't go to be with the other souls that want to go to heaven. Don't join together with them. Don't, and by being there, uh, uh, we probably don't encourage anybody. I mean, we, some of us just aren't people people, you know. We just don't talk that much. We just don't get together that much and so on. That has nothing to do with serving God. It has to do with us being servants of God Almighty. And us being together to serve together. And in a, to encourage. And we're not always good at that. But that's not the main point. The main point is, we do that which serves God. We sing to serve God. We speak of others to serve God our Lord. We do all that we know how to do in our hour-to-hour living with family and with friends and with total strangers so we can serve God. It's amazing that sometimes we spend hours looking around, months in planning and so on, to do something so we can show God we're serving Him. But God is looking at us 24 hours a day and saying, Are you serving me today? What are you doing today? Do you not want that soul that I have put inside that human body of yours to be there with me? Is that not what you're focused upon? Yes, thank you for the planning that you're doing. Thank you for the reach out that you are trying to do and so on. But what are you doing in the meantime? Every time you gather together, and even when you are not together, you are to be serving me. I'm giving you the choice giving you the choice and I want you to serve me we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works God prepared the works in advance for us to do Ephesians 2 and 10 he already prepared it It wasn't like we got a a scratch on the wall and figure out well what do we do to worship him what, what uh, I don't know what to do. I, I just need to rest today. God prepared in advance. Ephesians 2 and 10. He prepared in advance. Just think about all those saints that have gone on before us. People that you admired for their faith. For their service. Their service to the Lord. Think of the ones that we read about. I don't mean just those that we know physically here on earth, but those that the scriptures have told us about. Think of the saints. Think of Moses and Daniel and Jacob and Esther and and James and Paul and Mark and Mary and Jesus. Uh, Just to name a few. They all will be there and we will all fellowship together. Amen. And share like we have never, never, never shared before. I do believe that in heaven there will be much singing and there will be much serving and much sharing. It's a place that dreams can never compare to and that words can never describe. All the words in the Bible cannot ultimately and in a maximum sense to us explain everything that is going to take place and how glorious it can be. There just aren't human words for it. There are not human words for it. Heaven is a place for you and I. It's a place for us, and it is the only way to get there is the Lord comes or we have to die. We've already reviewed death, but let's just take a Short little review here again. When a person dies, there's a temporary separation of the body and the soul, 2 Corinthians. This is true even of unbelievers. There's a separation of the body. And that separation, who will one day be resurrected to face God's judgment, and in John 5, and it is that time prior to the resurrection of our bodies, but after our deaths, 
that when our souls are with the Lord. So what will this temporary state be like for us when we are with and yet still awaiting the resurrection of our bodies? We spoke about it uh, last week when we were speaking about uh, Hades, hell, half paradise, half in torment. When you look at Revelation 6, a passage which describes those who have been martyred. Now I do want to note that. Martyred for Christ means you have been killed because you believe in Christ. Christians killed all the time. And, and not disparaging whatsoever to say that, that Christians who, who are killed, but these people that they're talking about here in Revelation 6 are killed because they believe in Christ. And, and, and that goes on in the world. We understand that. Martyred for their faith and they're awaiting God's final judgment and the resurrection. When you look at that, When you look at that, they're able to express themselves so that they can be heard by others. They're called out in a loud voice. Verse 10 of the passage tells us that. Uh, it assumes that they were able to put on um, white robes. And you know, I just hit the wrong button the wrong way. Wait a minute. One more. Boop. Excuse me. And one more. Boop. Thank you. They can express themselves. They are aware of time element. Um, there's an audience uh, with God. There's nothing in text that leads us to believe that this is the type of experience is limited only to those who have been martyred. But that's the specifics what the passage is talking about. Those who were martyred. Those who were killed because they believe Christ. It wasn't for anything else for which they were killed. Killed because they believe Christ. But there's nothing in here to limit us to only to those who have been martyred in the faith. As a matter of fact, many of the same conclusions can be drawn about these passages and what was happening with them to uh, the story of, of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, which I think is, is very, very similar to the expressions of what's being talked about, those who were being uh, martyred. So when we look at that, what does it mean for us? Well, it means that you're a believing family and believing friends who have preceded you in death. I would assume we all have Christian brothers and sisters who have preceded us in death. And fundamentally, what we learn from these passages, they're doing well. Because this is where you expect to be as well. And how you expect to deal with it. They can express themselves. They're aware of time. They actually have an audience uh, with God. There's concern for justice. They even said, Lord, but those people down there on earth who did this to me. Concern for justice. They have memories of earth. Now, this is prior to the new and the old. Because they're there now. And there hasn't been a passing of the old life and the old earth and a creation of all things new yet. It hasn't happened yet. But these people know what's going on with them. Um, there's individuality among them. Uh, they were given white robes, which the assumption if you're given a white robe, you have a form, some sort of form. I guess it looks like our form now. It's not the body, but it's a form. And they put on the white robe. They're aware of God's plan, which also lets us understand it hasn't been completed yet. They're there. We're here. The plan hasn't been completed yet. The process has not been completed yet. So, um, that 
these awareness issues, uh, what they're doing right now up there, be somewhat different, but not totally. These things can still be applied to us, but the new will have come when we all, and the earth is gone, and all humans have been separated from their bodies. Um, so we have the same thing to look forward to. What will we see in this new heaven? What will we see? We will see a city that is illuminated by God. It talks about uh, there will be no more moon there will be uh, or sun. It's illuminated by God, not by moon and sun. Um, to light our way because the Bible tells us that God is light, does it not? So that's the light that's illuminating heaven for us. His Son is the light of the world, is he not? It's a city surrounded by a great high uh, wall with 12 massive gates, as described to us, three of them facing in each of the directions. And these are positions uh, positioned to limit access as well. Uh, it's just because of the way that they're structured and where they're at. To limit access only to those who enter the right way. And, uh, John chapter 14 gives a little more detail there. In addition, they would, they would serve to remind us, as we're looking at this, that the gospel is for all men. Now that's an interesting reference when you see verses uh, 12 and 14 of uh, John uh, chapter 14. We are going to see, it says, that the gospel is for all men. What, what do you think you will see any different than you see now of men? Don't know. I don't know exactly what that's referring to. Of men. Like, they're all there, and in addition, they would serve to remind us that God, that the gospel is for all men. Well, we know it's for all men. But why would we see something there that reminds us of that particular? I don't know. A city that's prepared for believers who have lived throughout history. Interesting. Now the gates, uh, the 12 gates here were named for the uh, 12 sons of Israel, for the 12 apostles. The foundation stones are named for the, uh, I'm sorry, for the 12 apostles. Um, it's adored with precious stones, which we would recognize, of course, and with streets of gold. We've known that for as long as we've, we've been talking or reading about the scriptures. It's a city that's unlike uh, the old Jerusalem. Um, a uh, city that's unlike old Jerusalem uh, had, uh, has no, no temple. Why is there no temple in heaven? Because God and the Son are the temple. God and the Son are the temple. A city that never shuts its gates because there's no fear of an invading enemy, is there? No fear at all. Keep your doors unlocked. Gates are never closed. A city that would never be corrupted by sin because it can't be. A city that had a river running down through the middle of it. It's a river of the water of life. And both sides, the tree of life. There will be no more death in heaven. Once you're there, you're there. There will be no more death in heaven. Before I became a Christian, I hung around Christians. Well, there's this girl who I wanted to date. And her father said, you can date her every Sunday and every Wednesday. Oh, I did. So we're all looking forward to heaven. So with such an amazing eternity, what stands between us and eternity? 
Why isn't everybody wanting to go there and be there and to serve God? Why? Because they just don't probably have enough understanding of who they are or what they are and what they get involved with and what they shouldn't get involved with stands between us and eternity and heaven and all my, with Almighty God. Simple human brain that's trying to think the wrong way, I guess, doesn't understand where it's coming from or what it's doing. Sure, we, we live lives in which we're dropped or we're crumbled or we're ground into the dust. Who hasn't gone through that to one degree or another? Some more severely than others, maybe so. And all these different circumstances that come our way that we really don't want to deal with or we don't deal with properly. But no matter what has happened or will happen to any of us, you never lose your value in God's sight. You know, you can be the most wretched human that ever existed upon this earth. The Bible tells us of some. The most wretched human being. But their value did not diminish in God's sight. Look at all the horrible things they did. Their value did not diminish in God's sight. So, so it doesn't matter how rotten you were, how despicable you were, God never gave up on anyone. No matter what they did, no matter what they did, pick out the vilest humans you've ever heard of. Who created them? God. And then man got to choose what he was going to serve. The majority of men choose the wrong thing. Maybe that's because they've never done anything right. Maybe they can't figure out what is right. I don't know. But you have to remember here, with so much an amazing eternity in heaven and what stands between us, we don't want to be pushed aside because we don't think we're good enough. He wants things from us, absolutely. But he has never devalued a human soul. A soul. We always have to remember that the devil is our enemy. He will, he will lie to you all the time. He will deceive you by saying, what, 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 what would you say? If you really want to discourage somebody... And there's some people who are really good at discouraging some people. They'll say, well, let me tell you, there's just no hope for you. I mean, you, you, don't, you haven't got it. You can't make it this work. <laughs> this job isn't going to work out for you. you you're going to marry him. What are you going to do that for? There's something wrong with you, dear. No, you're not going to marry him. Don't let that go on with you. Give me, a, give me a break, will you? Be deceived. You're too bad. God doesn't really want you. I mean, come on, look how you're living. God wants you. It's too late. Hey, you missed your chance. I'm not dead yet. Oh, you missed your chance. You've messed up your life. You're not going to turn any of this around. You can't change it now. God can't love you now. You are no good. Look at your past. God won't use you. Nobody cares about you. God doesn't love you. You'll never amount to anything. Humans have spoken this to other humans. Humans have felt these things themselves. God has never diminished a human. God has never diminished the soul he implanted in that body. Because the King of Kings tells us today, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and to give you a future. I have given you a new beginning. I take great delight in you, he says. I rejoice over you with singing. As the heavens are singing, we are singing. I forgave your past. You didn't ask, but I forgave your past. I want you to look forward. Don't look back. I want you to look forward. You are a new creation. You learn to follow me. You are a new creation. Show others how to follow. Make them new creations as well. All things 
all things have become new. So, a man standing in the right spot. He's been looking up all this time. He wants to offer everything to the Lord that there is. And death he understands. Heaven is where he wants to go. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this day. We give thanks to you for the life. We give thanks to you for everything you have blessed us with, Father. All the striving, all the prayers that we know, Father, happen. We want to be strong. We want to be determined. We know, Father, that we are not perfect. We know, Father, that we make mistakes. We know, Father, we do things that are wrong. We know, Father, that we need to seek your forgiveness daily. But we want to be in heaven with you, Lord. We want to be in heaven with you, dear Father. Help us. Comfort us. Bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. There's no audio. May God continue to bless us all. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, get your uh, out.